We've been talking for the past few weeks about Christ-centered living. Christ-centered living is putting Jesus at the center of our lives. A Christ-centered person is a person who puts the needs, desires, and purposes of Jesus as their priorities in life. We normally contrast Christ-centered living with self-centered living. A self-centered person is a person who puts their needs, wants, and desires and purposes first. Now, it really is too bad that the question is not just a question between Christ-centered living and self-centered living. It's a little bit more complicated than that. So far, we have looked at people and probably... Some of us who put family or spouse or money at the center of your life instead of Jesus. We talked about a church, about what they can do with all kinds of things at the center of them. And we come to worship these instead of the Lord. We put these before the Lord. They become idols of worship in our lives. Today I want to deal with those of us who put our enemies at the center of our lives. And I have been taking tours in people's lives for a long time. And I'm here to tell you we put our enemies at the center of our lives a lot of times. We may not worship them like we can family or spouse or money, but we can be totally preoccupied with our enemies to the exclusion of all else. So I want us to move our enemies into the center of our lives today and see what it means to be enemy-centered in our lives. You bring up the first one. This, by the way, is the cat's eye nebula. It kind of looks like an eye. Will you look at that? Well, as it shifts here, you have a circle that looks like an eye, too, with self at the center. And I want to move Jesus and enemy into that center picture up there. Most of us would never think of putting an enemy at the center of our life, let alone let our enemies become more important and more consuming of who we are than Jesus. Probably none of us would do it consciously, but I would say that you will be surprised how many of us really are consumed by our enemies. And how we exclude Jesus from our lives because of those enemies. Those enemies become obstacles that block our vision of Jesus. We live and work with people all the time. And with all these interpersonal relationships and frequent interactions between people, conflict develops. And enemies are made. If you feel you have been unjustly dealt with by a family member a spouse, your spouse, maybe your kids, maybe your parents. How about an employee or a boss or a friend or anyone who is a significant person in your life? It is very easy for you to become preoccupied with the injustice and what that person looks like as an enemy and he can move in he or she can move into the center of your life and demand your priority attention if you are enemy centered you react to the behavior and attitudes you perceive in your enemy is there someone in your life right now I know that with all these people I take tours in people's lives is there somebody in your life right now a co-worker A boss, an employee, a family member like son or daughter. Maybe it's one of your parents or both of your parents. How about an ex-spouse? Or how about a spouse? Might be your brother or your sister or a friend in which a negative relationship has developed. How dare I say it? Could be your pastor. Do you allow yourself to think about them so much so that when when you're in their presence that it affects the quality of your relationship with others or at work, maybe it's at church? Has your relationship with this person, 
driven you or them out of your life? Would you prefer to go on with your life as if that person weren't around, as if that person were dead? But this person's presence bugs you so much that it keeps you from being in certain places and certain groups. If you have a person or persons in your life that you can answer yes to these kinds of questions, then I have one more question for you. Why have you let this person become the center of your life, an enemy center? Now, you may sit there and deny it if you want to, but it's still true. You know, my, part of my job, is to scrape the grime off troublesome pots in the sinks of your unconscious. <laughs> so it can still be true, even though you don't want to believe it. You might have allowed that individual or group and their weakness to distort your life, undermine your faith in Jesus, and weaken the quality of your relationships with those who may also pass through that relationship. Now, you may accept it or not, but it's still true. Let's push it a little farther. You are responsible for putting this person or group at the center of your life. The truth is because you are responsible for your life when it comes to your enemy, as you put your enemy at the center of your life, you have been ir become irresponsible in your life. Many of us are enemy-centered, to varying degrees. I have been. Over the years, you know, you don't drive in this world that long before you have an accident with somebody or something. So you can actually do it in varying degrees. Many divorced people are still consumed by anger and bitterness and resentment and self-justification regarding an ex-spouse. I'm going to tell you, until your mind changes, the divorce is just legal fiction. Their ex is the enemy. Or it might not just be the ex, it could be the ex's boyfriend or girlfriend becomes the enemy. And Jesus is pushed out of the center. I know this. Some of us hate one or both of our parents. I know this. Some of us blame them for past abuses, neglect, favoritism, and your parent becomes an enemy center in your life. You react to your parent. You justify your reactions. You will slide into the second one. Pay attention. He's looking at you, kid. You watch this eye, and it shifts, kind of like the cat's eye nebula did. Now you've got the enemy, but you've got Jesus. You've got yourself at the center. Now you notice the four arrows that are coming off there, which give you identity and direction and balance and purpose in life. If you are enemy-centered, your identity is all tied up by the way your enemy feels towards you. You seek your identity and self-worth and security from those who are on, quote, your side, unquote, in the conflict between you and your enemy. You get your direction in life and decisions as you see what the moves and actions of your enemy are, your balance in life shifts to one of defense over reaction, and your judgments become distorted by your feelings towards your enemy. Your purpose in life gains its power from anger and envy and resentment and bitterness and vengeance. And your purpose in life is to destroy your enemy. Now, I mentioned people or individuals that we make our enemies, but here's the other thing. Not all of our enemies are individuals. In fact, most of our enemies are more, lo more like smoke in our eyes that we can't get a handle on. So let me raise up to you other enemies that we have. And keep it in mind that the four arrows, 
Because as we focus on these enemies, consider how they affect your identity, your security, your direction in life, your balanced judgment of life, and your purpose. Webster defines enemy as a person who is antagonistic to another or a person who seeks to injure, overthrow, or confound an opponent. That's one definition. That is a person. But there is another definition for enemy. An enemy is something harmful or deadly or, hot or a hostile force. Now, if you look at this wheel, either one of them, anything on this wheel can become your enemy. Even your friend can become your enemy. The world can become your enemy. So today I want to focus on the enemies we all have in varying degrees. Now, anyone here like me and feel like only the young have fun? You know, there are three things in life that never go out of style. You know what they are? Youth, beauty, and money. They never go out of style. Now, people my age, or let's just take some of you, between the, I'm going to be, I'm going to be generous, between the ages of 30 and, say, 55, you are the people who occupy positions of power, make decisions, you pay the bills, you carry the major responsibilities of life, we have the pressures on us from the community. You have pressures from the church, from your family, from your businesses, from your jobs. Problem is, I'm not as fast as I used to be or have the energy I used to have. How about you? My body says to my mind, who are you trying to kid? When I was in my late 40s, I had two kids in college, and I'd already had two kids go through college, and I came to realize that I was nature's natural banker. But my finances were a wreck at the time. And, you, you know, at the time I was down in Kentucky, and those people were like you. They were generous to us as a family. But you know what? We're all consumers. And daddies are nature's natural bankers. Just put an ATM card in our mouths and money comes out. Now, I, I don't know if I'm talking to any of you or not, but let me talk to the men for a couple of minutes. Now, I'm going to give you a break here, guys. Midlife, 35 to 55, I expect you to live to be 110. Man in midlife. Maybe you are a man in midlife, or maybe you're a woman in midlife, okay? Let me tell you about your enemies. There is a concept in business called the Peter Principle. Sounds like the disciple, doesn't it? Well, it says that a man will advance in his work and be given greater and greater responsibility until he becomes incompetent. Then most businesses let him go. The man in midlife has two forces that converge in his work life. He may be pushed to a level of responsibility that is beyond him, which brings about frustration. His body is slowing down and unable to handle the stress. His job becomes his enemy. The man feels like a vending machine anyway. Someone pushes a button, out comes, well, for in my case, it was, out came a sermon or a Bible study. But for you, it might be a decision or money. Push the button. And you have to run a meeting. He could feel inadequate because of lost youth and strength. And fatigue sets in. The man in the midlife can have his job as his enemy. The man in midlife has as his enemies his job, his family, his spouse, his responsibilities. Gentlemen, we have enemies in this world. They can become the center of our focus in our lives. Our first enemy is our own bodies. 
They are aging, slowing down, and losing youthful appeal. Aren't they, guys? You know, when I was younger, women would look at me, and it would give me a sense of masculinity. But they don't do that much anymore. They just call me sir or mister or Pastor Jack. You know, I used to be good looking. Now I'm just looking good. <laughs> when did it happen? You know, we men get aggravated because our energy and our stamina is waning and we have trouble dealing with flabby muscles and weight gain. We hate the little aches and pains that never used to be present. Our very bodies become our enemies, and they can become the center of our vision. Our work is another enemy. How in the world did we ever get trapped into this job? Some of us think that. Why would anyone want to be president of Acme Widgets? We want to get off the treadmill, the grind of the daily routine which we have to continue to meet our heavy financial obligations. Work is not a challenge, but it becomes oppressive. Or in the last five, six years, especially around here, but all across the country, men losing their jobs. And they hang around, they do odd things and stuff, and they can't find a job. And that becomes the enemy. How about it, guys? Am I talking to you? Another enemy can be the wife and kids. Right, guys? Of course. We wouldn't admit to that. But they are, aren't they? Our job provides for all these consumers that we take care of. The house, the cars, the vacations, the kids in college. But if we didn't have all those family responsibilities, we could quit our jobs and live off the land. And if we weren't married, we could knock around like our sons do. For some of us, our families become our enemies. And for some of us, the ultimate enemy is God. Isn't he? On this wheel... We could just scratch Jesus out and write enemy in there for God or him, couldn't we? Same way with church and anything else that has to do with God, like the preacher. You know, I am the enemy of some just because of who I represent. God can become our enemy because we picture him pointing his bony finger at us and saying, you are despicable, you're selfish, lustful, lazy, and disgusting as a mature man. God is not only our enemy, but he is unfair. Didn't he make us this way? Our bodies going into the toilet, our drives and interests, all this stress and pressure that we're under, so we blame God for the mess in our lives. Now, you men know what I am talking about. And ladies, if you don't think your man or men in general wrestle with these things, see if you can get a man to be honest with you. Now, ladies, not to be left out, you have enemies too. One of your enemies may be that man you live with who is being driven by some of the things that I just described. He used to be so nice, but there has been some kind of personality change take place. And ladies, how about your bodies? Have you tried that new look yet? Are you thinking about it? Is it possible that your enemy is your own body? Or maybe it's just a younger women. Ladies, are your kids your enemy? I mean... They used to call you mom, but now they call you mother. How dare they grow up and leave? <laughs> or how dare they grow up and stay? <laughs> if they were your friends, they wouldn't think of growing up and leaving you all alone, making you feel useless and worthless. 
Are your kids your enemy? Ladies, what about menopause? Or the fear of being barren, not being able to have children. Or losing your husband. Or becoming sexless. Or not having a man around. Is there an enemy of time involved that lurks about in your mind? We don't like to talk about this stuff because these are our enemies and the battle rages in our minds and in our lives a lot of the time. But it's there. Nobody talks about it, but it's underneath. Ladies, as I said uh, uh, last week, you have a tendency to put family and spouse in the center of your life and make them your gods. What happens then is that your identity and direction, balance and purpose are all wrapped up in them. Your family and spouse can become your enemy because your husband may be going through midlife crisis and is unstable. And your children are breaking their relationship with you as they grow up. And ultimately, for all of us, the king of all enemies is time. Time brings us all down. And when enough time passes, we die. And we come up against the greatest enemy that we know, death. In the story of Peter Pan, is the, really it's the story of lost childhood. And the one thing that was always the nemesis of Captain Hook in Never Never Land was that crocodile. Good for Mr. Smee. Most good form! Did Pan show good form when he did this to me? I can't him. <laughs> Cutting your hand off was only a childish prank, you might say. Aye, but throwing it to that crocodile, that cursed beast like the taste of me so well, he's followed me ever since. Licking his chops for the rest of me. <laughs> He'd have heard you by now, Captain, <laughs> if he hadn't swallowed their alarm clock. But now when he's about, he warns you, as you might say, with his tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. in that the crocodile represents time. The crocodile had swallowed a clock. And so Hook always knew when the crocodile was around and he could hear time ticking. The croc had already eaten part of Hook and was just waiting for the time when he could get the rest of Hook. Time was waiting to eat the life right out of Captain Hook. That was his enemy. Time is the enemy of all of us, and like the crocodile sitting in the water waiting to devour us, it slowly keeps on ticking day by day. God created time, therefore God must be our enemy. But what if? What if God is our friend? Join with me in reading Psalm 102, verses 3 to 11. Find it. Let's read it together. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is smitten like grass and withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my Lord groaning, my bones cleave to my flesh. I am like a vulture of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely bird on the housetop. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of thy indignation and anger, 
for thou hast taken me up and thrown me away. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. And when you read that stuff, who's the enemy there? God is the enemy. Time is the enemy. But I want you to read with me the first two verses of this psalm, which is also in your bulletin. Here we go. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let me cry. Come. Did we miss something? Oh, a prayer of one afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayers, O Lord. Let me cry, come to thee. Do not hide thy face from me in the day of my distress. Incline thy ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. Today we come to the Lord's table. It is the table that Jesus sets before us in the presence of our enemies. When he sat at table with his disciples, he was surrounded by enemies. As he sat there, Judas was with him, his personal enemy, the one who was to betray him. The country around them was filled with Romans, the enemies of God's people. The night was filled with plots to kill Jesus. He was surrounded by the enemies who were the church of the day. Time was running out. He was about to encounter the ultimate enemy, death itself, and yet he sat there with his disciples, and he gave them the bread and the cup, his body and blood broken and shed for them and for us. Today we come to the Lord's table. When somebody dies, and I have a funeral or a memorial service or a graveside, I almost always read Psalm 23 at the grave. That psalm seems to give a sense of peace in the midst of the enemies we all have. I'd like for you to read with me verses 1 to 4. Here we go. A psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. A psalm that brings a sense of peace. As Jesus sat there with his disciples in the presence of his enemies, he asked them to remember, to remember that time. And he looked forward to the ultimate defeat of his enemies and the enemy of death. When we look back on today, these might be the good old days. He sits with us today. When he was hanging on the cross dying, he said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing to me. Read with me Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. Here we go. But I say to you that here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And of him who takes away your goods, do not ask them again. And as you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, 
for he is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. It is because of his life and death for us that we can bring him into the center of our lives. Even if we have enemies present, we can truly speak the rest of Psalm 23. Join with me in the last two verses of Psalm 23. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You have a post-it note in your bulletin. That post-it note is for you if you want to write down, for some of you it's like a dying moment, an enemy to you. And as we come and we take communion today, as you go back around, you can put it in one of these baskets that's off to the side and take one of the little silver crosses, that are actually they're aluminum, not silver, with you as a sign that you're letting that go. This is the table the Lord has prepared for you today in the presence of our enemies. He's the host here. We are his guests. Let's let Jesus sit down with us in the presence of our enemies and declare him once again, or maybe for the first time, Lord of our lives. Then we, with his help, and say, forgive them, and help us to forgive them. They don't know what they are doing to me. And then our enemies will no longer be our enemies and at the center of our lives.